Welcome, nerd ballers, to the third iteration of Nerding Out with Nick Bodiford. I am your host, Nick Bodiford. Today, uh, I'm flying solo, and we are going to be breaking down the NFC East. First team first, Dallas Cowboys. So uh, 2020 was kind of a story of two seasons for the team. One was obviously with Dak Prescott. The other was with Ben DiNucci and Andy Dalton. Uh, for 2021, they've got a really difficult strength of schedule per sharp football stats.com. But with, with the way that they run this team with this like analytically inclined pass first team, that's just loaded with talent, like up front in the receiving core in the backfield too, as they've got a couple pass catchers that are capable back there. It's really hard to stop them. Like this is kind of one where just defense doesn't matter while they had Dak last year through weeks uh, one, two, three, and four Dallas led the league in uh, first down conversion rate on first half early downs at a rate of 43%. Only four teams in the NFL were above the 40% mark. And the the next closest I think was like 42. Uh, so Dallas, they, what they were doing last year was, was really special. Um, they also averaged 69.6 plays per game during that span, which was the second most in the league. Um, Oh, no, excuse me. That was for the whole season. So even without Dak, they were still like, let's just keep our, our pedal to the metal. Um, I'm not worried about anybody based on on uh, on strength of schedule in this offense just because of how intelligently run it is and how talented all the players are. So Dak, uh, earlier this week, he yesterday, he popped up with the uh, the right shoulder strain. Early reports indicate that they're just going to let him rest and that shouldn't that that should be it. I believe it's a muscle strain. So, I mean, you know, it's good. It's not a bone. It's not a ligament. This is just soft tissue that needs to get healthy. Uh, as of now, I'm not worried about him. I'm He's still my quarterback three. I'm happy to take him at his ADP in the middle of the fifth round as the quarterback five. Uh, same thing with this pass catch, two primary pass catchers. So I think CD Lamb. So there was a report that came out like on Monday or Tuesday of this week that indicated CD Lamb is no longer going to be limited to the slot. Last year, he ran routes out of the slot at like at 93.2% per PFF, which is crazy. That's super hot. Um, they did this because of the COVID stunted preseason. They didn't have a lot of time for him to gain reps on the outside. They had Amari Cooper, they had Michael Gallup who could handle reps on the outside so they just kept lamb in there as a rookie this year he's going to be moving around and remember before before amari cooper came to dallas he was one of the league's best slot receivers or rather performed best when in the slot he uh graham barfield had some awesome stats with him being like a top five receiver when he was running routes in the slot since he came to dallas he's developed he can play x really well now uh, but I'm wondering if they want Lamb, who's a little bit more of a like special physical specimen, to take over as the X, or at least make these two guys interchangeable and just just have them rotating between the two positions. So I've got Lamb right now as my wide receiver 11. I've got Amari Cooper as my wide receiver 13. I, I bumped uh, Cooper down two spots and Lamb up like five spots this week, um, in large part because of that, re that report. And then also because... Amari Cooper is currently on the PUP list uh, because he had, I think it was an ankle scope. Um, it was a cleanup procedure, which is fairly ambiguous. The timeline right now for him to return is preseason week two. So if, if he goes, you know, past that, uh, that timeline, then that might be a problem because we do want guys to have the ramp up period. Um, it, it is empirical at this point that players who don't experience the preseason ramp up period where they slowly acclimate their bodies to NFL action. They end up with some higher rates of, of soft tissue injury. So that's something that we want to watch. And Cooper has a small history with ankle injury. So everybody just needs to monitor that. But right now I'm not altering, like I'm not fading away. Um, I'm not fading either of these guys. So lamb is going at, as the first, uh, first pick in the fourth round per fantasy football calculator.com. Uh, Cooper five spots later at 406. I would be thrilled to get them uh, either one at either of those spots. And if you can get both of them, like end a third, beginning of fourth, then get Dak in the fifth, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott last year, he looked a little bit slow. He's only, he was only 25 years old last year though. And I, you know, he's a guy who has shown up out of shape. There've been a number of times. I think there was a time when they like put him on a weight plan or something 
he likes to party in the off season. And I think that without the training camp and everything last year, he didn't take his off season as seriously as he should have. Uh, and he kind of looked it like he, he looked like he didn't go through, uh, you know, a normal training camp. He has evidently shown up to training camp in the best shape of his life. The photos are out there. Um, we get these stories all the time. This, uh, you know, this so-and-so is in the best shape of her life. With Dak, someone who has had a history of both performing really well and, you know, liking to have a few beers in the offseason, um, this is one that I do want to pay attention to because the proof does seem to be in the pudding just with the way that he has showed up in shape. So he's he's 26, year old, 26 years old for this season. Something that Dr. Edwin Poras of FantasyPoints.com likes to talk about is the, uh, the, the t- I think it's the top 12 backs, the average age of those backs for the last, uh, well, I don't, I'm not sure, five years, six years. Uh, so a good amount of data. Um, the top 12 guys are between 22 and 26 years old. So Zeke is still right in that, in his prime uh, range. So given the fact that he's, he's playing for the Dallas Cowboys, um, you know, they're going to be living in opponent's red zone. So I like, like him a lot. I've got him as my running back five right now. He's going as the fifth player off the board. I think that's a totally okay place to take him. <clears throat> Michael Gallup last year was way overdrafted. They really did throw the ball a lot to C.D. Lamb, and it, it hurt Gallup more than a lot of us thought it would, even after Blake Jarwin was out for the year last year uh, when he tore his ACL in week one, foreshadowing, coming back to that. I think Gallup is at a, going at a much more reasonable ADP. He's going in the 12th round as a wide receiver 53. Um, he really is just this downfield guy, and I know that this is kind of lazy um, analysis here. He's a little better in best ball. Um, we're given their schedule there, we're not really going to have that many matchups that, uh, that we're going to be able to see and go, Hey, uh, uh, Gallup's got a really good chance of like burning past the, the safety uh, against this team. Cause these guys are, are weak. They, they've got really, they're playing a lot of really, really good defenses. So that, that, that kind of matchup playing is going to be a little bit harder with this team this year. That doesn't mean I wouldn't take him in the, in the 12th round. I absolutely would even in redraft, um, you know, not non best ball leagues, um, just know he might be a little bit frustrating from time to time. Um, but if one of these guys gets hurt, uh, not, you know, not a tight end, but one of the receivers gets hurt, he's going to take on a lot larger role. And, uh, and, and in the 12th round, it's okay to consider a, a guy. Um, it's okay to consider that aspect when drafting a player, eighth round, seventh round, that, that kind of thing is a little too early, but 12th round, we like that. Um, Next position. So Blake Jarwin, the dude looked great in training camp last year. I, I was all on board with him as a, a breakout tight end. He tore his ACL in week one. Dalton Schultz strolls into the picture, who's really kind of a subpar athlete. And and um, again, Jarwin, like freak athlete. Schultz in 15 games, he played 11 of them with Ben DiNucci and Andy Dalton thrown in the rock. He finished this the tight end 14 and half point PPR. So if, if a, a lackluster player like Dalton Schultz can finish as a top 15 tight end, which I, I know that's not, you know, we want these elite guys, but if you don't get one, you're going to have to look for the best value you can. Uh, I like uh, Blake Jarwin's potential to finish far ahead of, of Dalton Schultz's uh, 2020 tight end 14 mark. So keep him on your radar as a guy who I, I think I've got him as my like uh, tight end 12 or so right now. Um, but he, he could be a guy who could, who could get a little bit higher up, maybe tight end date. <clears throat> Tony Pollard, I've been singing his praises for a few years, but I think it's time to accept the fact that, um, or a few years, two years, he's been in the league for two years. They like him as a punt returner. They put him in on uh, passing downs from time to time, but he's not hes not the guy that uh, they don't think of him as how, as how I think of him, which is that he, he they should trade Zeke away for uh, cornerbacks and other things that impact the passing game on both sides of the ball and just utilize Tony Pollard uh, on a majority of snaps and throw him the ball. I think that that would be great, uh, but uh, not here or there. Pollard, he's just not going to get the kind of work that we want him to get, um, which makes his ninth round ADP RB 43. RB 43 is okay, but ninth round, that's an early price to pay for a handcuff, but he does have extreme upside should anything happen to, to Zeke be that you know PEDs um, injury what have you but yeah Pollard is not going to be a guy that you're going to get a lot of production uh, out of like on a, on a weekly basis it's it's not a 1a 1b backfield New York uh, football giants so I, I'm no fan of Joe Judge I'm even less of a fan of, of Jason Garrett 
But what we have here is a really interesting thing with the with the strength of schedule. Um, they're playing some pretty tough defenses this year, but they're also playing really awful offenses. Uh, I, mean, I know they have to play uh, the cow the Cowboys twice, and, and that, that stinks for sure. But uh, by and large, like with their 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 season as a whole, they don't face a ton of imposing offenses. So it seems unlikely that they're, they're, they're going to play a bunch of ball control. That's a better way to put it. Not bad per se, but ball control. So like Chicago, Indianapolis, Seattle, Tennessee, Minnesota, Baltimore. Again, these are good offenses, but they also are also ones that kind of like to control the clock. So it's unlikely that games just like get out uh, of, of grasp and they, they, and the, the giants get thrust out of their game script, which I guess, you know, maybe we want that for a higher passing volume. Um, but we know who our guys are that we want in this offense. It's Saquon Barkley, obviously number one. Saquon comes to, with the questions of how is his knee doing after the injury last year where he completely ruptured his ACL, he uh, he sprained his MCL, and he sprained his menis- meniscus. When it comes to these kind of things, we have to rely on the professionals. Again, I, I love the, the work done by Dr. Edwin Porras. I also highly recommend Dr. Uh, Jesse Morse, uh, Dr. David Chow. From what I've read from Dr. Poros on on uh, on fantasypoints.com, and I believe this article, the, the medical case for Saquon Barkley is, is available for free. Uh, so even if you don't have a subscription, you should go read this piece. One thing that, that Barkley has going for him is that he didn't, he uh, the MCL and the meniscus did not require any uh, surgical repairs. It was only the ACL. So that's great. All he had, they had to do was rehab the other stuff to, to get it back to full health. Um, we like to hear that. We like to, this, this just, you know, w- one thing is the only thing that had to actually be repaired, the, the isolated uh, ACL. That's great. Another thing that's really great is uh, medical science is beginning to show that beginning uh, physical therapy before ACL reconstruction is hugely beneficial in players' recovery times. So dutifully, Saquon Barkley, unlike, you know, a player maybe with the Saints, um, Barkley went and, and started his prehab before he had surgery, he had the surgery, huge success, huge success. He is, he's, um, he's on his timeline. He's like, he's, he's doing great. And by the time the year starts, he's going to be, um, in the, the, uh, a range, a timeline range that we really aren't that concerned about, uh, re-injury. So post 18 months after surgery, that is when you're like zero concerns. The next window there, is nine to 12 months. There's no difference in re-injury rates of the ACL between nine and 12 months post-op. Most players return to play around 11 or 12 months. And I believe he's going to be like at 11.5 months, uh, maybe, maybe 12 exactly. Uh, No, 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 not that one. Probably. Yeah. 11. Anyway, he's, he's in the range where he's not at an elevated, uh, an abnormally high uh, range of time where we might expect a, a, a re-injury. Another way to say this is go read Dr. Forrest's piece. He can ex- explain a lot uh, more concisely than I can. But what I expect um, is that Saquon Barkley is going to go over 300 touches. He could hit 300, uh, yeah, 350. Um, they're going to use him a ton in the passing game. They're going to use him a crap ton in the run game. They're going to bang him up the middle, and we don't love that. But at this point, volume is king, and this dude is absolutely one of the best running backs in the NFL. I would draft him with confidence at his current ADP 1.06 running back six. I actually have him ahead of uh, his NFC East counterpart, Zeke. I've got Zeke at RB5, and I've got Saquon Barkley as RB3. Staying in the certified beasts column, uh, Kenny Galladay. Galladay is an extreme talent. And Daniel Jones has a really bad arm. I like to uh, sometimes go to Matt Waldman for film advice. Everything he has had to say is that this is a really bad match. Daniel Jones's downfield accuracy is not good. And that is where Kenny Galladay excels. He's, he's a very talented downfield X receiver. What we're clinging to here with Galladay is uh, target volume. There's a good chance that Galladay gets over like 130 targets. And while there are some number twos, that might end up getting that number of targets. Um, He's going in the uh, like mid to late fifth round as the wide receiver 21. It's a, it's a tough, don't draft him ahead of that fifth round. We we can take him in the, in the fifth round. I've got him as the wide receiver 33. So I am, I am lower than him, but like talent and volume, it could get the job done here. 
Uh, I would not, I definitely would not draft. If you can get him as a flex play, great. I would not under any circumstances draft him as a wide receiver one. You could count him, count on him as a wide receiver two. Maybe you go tight end early or something like that. You know, tra- grab Travis Kelsey or something. Um, but yeah, Galladay, talent and volume. That's what we're banking on here. Rest of the certified beasts of this NFC East team, Evan Ingram. So uh, people were too bullish on, on Evan Ingram last year. He was coming off of Liz Frank surgery. It's a ligament in the foot and it really sucks to tear it. Players experience a 21% dip in production in the first year back. And this, again, this is uh, great information from Dr. Forrest's timeline. I highly recommend everybody go check this out. Um, it's free information. <clears throat> But yeah, this is, again, it's a 21% dip, meaning it's going to come back up. That was last year. Last year was the first year back. Um, and coincidentally, Kyle Rudolph, the, the veteran tight end that the Giants brought in this year to potentially compete with Evan Ingram, suffered a Liz Frank injury. And uh, as recently as this week, it was confirmed uh, that he did just have surgery on it. It was, it was uh, talked about as a foot issue, I guess, until this week. And we now have confirmation that Kyle Rudolph did, in fact, Terra's Liz Frank, it has been repaired, but we're talking about a guy whose play has uh, nosedived over the last couple of years. He's not the receiving 30 once was in Kyle Rudolph. And now he's in this window where on average players lose 21% of their raw counting stats, receptions, yardage, touchdowns. Evan Ingram is not going to face the in-house a competition that the drafting public seems to think he's going to face because he's currently being drafted as the tight end 18 with an ADP of 13.09. Smash that draft button. If you get in the 13th round and you only have one tight end on your roster, don't leave it without Evan Ingram. Get Evan Ingram. He's going to be a, a at worst a, a, a borderline tight end one, tight end two this season. I, I think he can be much, much better than that too. Um, conservatively, I have missed tight end 13 because he's catching passes with Daniel Jones. But again, I think uh, he's going to duke it out with Saquon Barkley for the uh, number two pass catching role. Okay, Sterling Shepard. The, the, I, I, I've been very high on this guy. Um, but the, the unique thing that he has going for him this year in his uh, first or excuse me, third or fourth season in the NFL, he doesn't have any in-house competition for a uh, – Label wise, a slot receiver. We know that Evan Ingram is going to light up at the slot a lot, but he's had to compete with like Golden Tate. And then he had another one earlier in his career too. Is it, they just kept bringing in other slot receivers. It didn't make sense. And they made Sterling Shepard go play uh, in the slot. But this year they brought in Kenny Galladay. He's going to operate as the X. Sterling Shepard can operate as a full-time slot receiver this year. I've got him as the wide receiver 63 and he's going like undrafted at this point. So like, this is a dude who could see like 90 targets. And again, they might be ugly targets, but if you can take him in like the second to the last round, this is a really good draft pick. Same thing goes with Darius Slayton. I've got him as the wide receiver 65, but he has zero 80 or uh, yeah, he's got zero ADP. These guys are not being drafted. So absolutely throw a dart. We were talking about these guys in like single digit rounds last year. And you know, I'm not saying like fourth or fifth round, but like back end, like eighth or ninth. Yeah. Now you can get him in the 15th or 16th. These are two players that you should absolutely be looking to add. If you're concerned about Kadarius Tony, the guy's not a polished route runner. I mean, he's not, he's not even a, a, a proficient route runner right now. He's a freak athlete, and I love me a freak athlete, but this guy is not someone who's ready to come in and just take over as a full-time player. And I know we might think that he's going to start taking all this like short area of uh, volume running out of the slot. I, I just don't think that's the case. Um, the way that, that again, Matt Waldman, dude is the man. The way he describes him is that he gets over his feet when he tries, he, because he runs like a 4 3 7 40. When, he, when he's running his routes, he ends up over his feet and his shoulders, his hips get out of alignment. And he, he, he's rounding corners. He's not cutting where he's supposed to be cutting. It's going to take at least a year until Kadarius Tony is ready for an actual role. And, and I'm, I'm pessimistic that it's going to be one year. I think that it could be two or three, excuse me. Uh, as, as far as the rest of the backfield goes, you could go get Devonte Booker if you want to, as like some kind of handcuff for Barkley, but Booker's never really been 
much of a pass catcher. He's really just a diminutive, uh, uh, pure rusher, like uh, Philip Lindsay or Matt Breida, that kind of a thing. So like, you're not going to get a lot of the, the, the passing volume. I, I'm, I wouldn't really waste my time on Booker if, if you if you draft Saquon Barkley, by the way. Okay, Philadelphia Eagles. So these guys have a schedule that's really, um, well, not really similar. It's just, I guess, in principle, it's somewhat similar to the Giants. It's very easy. Um, so in terms of their overall, I want to break this one down specifically. So overall offensive efficiency of opponents, second softest. Overall defensive, effic- defensive efficiency of opponents, 14th hardest. So that's kind of like edging towards the middle there. Efficiency of opposing passing games. So like the aerial attack of their opponents, the worst. The worst group of passing offenses in the league this year per sharpfootballstats.com. That's what their expectation is. Um, in terms of pass defenses, 12th hardest, which is not great for Jalen Hurts, but uh, efficiency of opposing opposing running games, 11th softest, and efficiency of opposing run defenses, also 11th softest. So what you're going to see, by and large, for the Philadelphia Eagles are teams that can't pl- they can't stop the run, they can't run the ball themselves, they cannot throw the ball themselves to save their lives. Again, worst pass- slate of passing offenses in the league. And again, they got two games against Dallas and that's great. But you look at the rest of their schedule, really teams that are not going to be efficient in passing the ball. Um, So what's this going to look like? This is going to look kind of hysterically because they just fired Doug Peterson for running the football too much. This is going to be a run heavy team. Jalen Hurts. uh, This is from Chris Raybon of the Action Network. Highly recommend the 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 episode will be linked in the uh, the NFC East piece that's coming out hopefully tomorrow morning. Uh, Chris Raymond talks about the fact that uh, Jalen Hurts' scramble percentage on of his dropbacks is 13.5. I don't know where that places in the league, but he described it as being ridiculously high. It's also a stat that is very consistent. It is sticky. It happens year to year. When a quarterback plays a certain way, he might make some alterations, but by and large, if he's a scrambler, he stays a scrambler. Against a terrible slate of uh, of run defenses, that's really good. And given the fact that opposing offenses are by and large weak, they're not going to be able to run up the score and put the Eagles very frequently in a position where they are forced to pass to stay in games. They're going to be able to stay in via the run game. So I am a lot more optimistic on Jalen Hurts than I was a couple of weeks ago when I was thinking he was going to have to win some games uh, with his arm. I've still got him towards the back of the tight or the quarterback one ranks as the quarterback 10. Um, but he's got a, uh, his ADP is 8.06. So mid eighth round quarterback 11. I think that that is a great place to take him. I would absolutely do that. Um, and maybe mix in one of his pass catchers too, but I mean, he's going to rip it up on the ground. It's going to be fun. Um, when it comes to the pass catchers, the thing that might hurt this group more than anything else is that there's a bunch of them. There's a lot of mouths to feed here. And so it might just be hard for these guys to subsist um, on efficiency rather, you know, Hertz is developing. We, we don't quite know what he is yet. So the, the volume really might not be there, but that said, I think Devonte Smith is a great option as a flex play. I've got him as the wide receiver 34 this year, but I, I really think that that's kind of a floor ranking because this dude is super friggin' talented um, won the, uh, what you call the Bolit- Bolitnikov last year, uh, best wide receiver in college. Uh, there are concerns. Some folks have concerns about his, uh, his, where he falls on the body mass in, in body mass index. He's around like, uh, 21 or 22. I don't know what that means, but I guess 26 is like as low as most people traditionally think you want to go again in the NFC East, uh, preview piece. I'll, I'll link to this, but there is a, a for free, thread by a physical therapist named Adam Hutchinson, where he breaks down uh, BMI, the follies of, of leaning on BMI when it comes to wide receiver production. Guys who Devontae Smith, and I know he's, because he's like six foot one, six two, and projected 176 pounds or something like that. He's slight of frame, but in terms of the BMI index, which is what everyone's pointing at saying, oh, his BMI is so low. We have to be concerned about him. The guys who he profiles similarly to are names like Adam Thielen, Calvin Ridley, and A.J. Green. Don't be afraid of Devontae Smith's BMI. This year, he may not see the, the target volume to be like a you know uh, high-end wide receiver too, but I think that this guy could be a long-standing X receiver 
in the NFL. His ADP of 7.06 wide receiver 30 would make for a perfect pairing. You take him, you come back in the middle of the next round, and you grab Jalen Hurts at 8.06. Moving on. Dallas Goddard, excuse me, Dallas Goddard. Uh, Zach Ertz, there's a reason that there is a, a, a Twitter handle that is uh, Zach Ertz breaks a tackle, and they tweet about whether or not Zach Ertz was able to break a tackle. He's not a very strong uh, person. Could he beat me up in the weight room? Yes, he absolutely could. But Zach Ertz, his body took a lot of tolls. He had a lot of injuries through his short career, and he's just kind of washed up at this point. Dallas Goddard is going to be the number one tight end in the Eagles offense. I have got him ranked as my tight end. Tight end 10. I'm kind of in the middle of the pack on the website right now. There's some guys who have got him around 6'7". There's another guy who's got him at 12. Um, I think 10 is a nice place to just kind of thread the needle with him. Volume, when it comes to other tight ends, should be there. I uh, I think that he's going to challenge Devontae Smith for the overall lead in targets uh, on the team this year. Bank on him as a mid to low tight end one, uh, but understand his talent is there that he could like start edging into the top five and maybe unseat uh, – yeah, maybe unseat a couple guys that, that we're thinking that he's not going to be able to. Miles Sanders. So Miles Sanders, um, he's a terrific dual threat running back. He just hasn't been. He hasn't seen these 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 big workloads. And I know that now with Jalen Hurts there and his thirteen point five percent scramble percentage, it's unlikely that Sanders is really going to be getting the passing game volume that we want him to get. But what I see with the strength of schedule is that the rushing volume that he gets might make up for it. And I think that he might be able to have a career year this year. Uh, last two years that he's always his third year entering the league uh, for his rookie year, 179 carries uh, last year, sophomore year, 164 carries. I think he could push for like 250. I know that that might be uh, uh, high for some folks, but I've got him as a running back 17. His current ADP is the RB 20 and he's coming off the board on the three, four turn. Um, I would feel a little bit better about him if I could get him at, in the early fourth round rather than the, the late third. But I think that, that Sanders is going to be a guy who just gashes opposing defenses. Um, I think he could have a decent touchdown total, but like, you know, 17 game season, I think he might go for like 1200 yards on the ground. Moving on to the, the rest of the guys in this backfield, uh, Kenneth Gainwell and Boston Scott. So Boston Scott, uh, re-signed uh, with the team this offseason. They gave him just a, a $920,000 one-year. It's a prove-it deal is what it is. He's a small guy, specializes in the passing game. I think he's he's, he's really unique in that, um, or the, the, the backfield has really been unique in that instead of having the like big-bodied guy and the smaller change of pace guy or, or you know, vice versa, uh, the Eagles have operated with these these backs that are just like, uh, average to small dual threats rather than really having a banger. We had Jordan Howard and I know Jordan Howard is, is vying for a roster spot again. Um, last year, I, I would hope that the Eagles kind of saw that he is super, super limited. I, you go look at the first like six games of last season with Miami every week, he had single digit yardage and one touchdown. I mean, he, he is a, a rush only guy. He is a, a less talented Adrian Peterson kind of, player i i really hope that they don't take uh touches away from from sanders uh with howard but here's the thing they drafted kenneth gainwell who profiles really similarly to boston scott in his his size like he's kind of an undersized guy but he's a dual threat i think that this front office likes having dual threat abilities the ability to rush in the ability to cast catch passes in this backfield right like it's notable that they just had miles sanders for a couple years and boston scott for a couple years and they were willing to let justin howard go they did bring him back i know but i i think that what they want is like a running back cupboard full of these dual threat guys so um i like the idea of investing in either boston scott or kenneth gainwell so i've got gainwell just because they drafted him this year they've got him uh, on a cost controlled deal for the next four years. That's something that Boston Scott doesn't bring off of them, right? He's just on this one year prove it deal. Um, Kenneth Gainwell, I've got him as a running back 56. I've got Boston Scott as a running back 57. Gainwell, his ADP is 13.10. So end of the 13th round, running back 58. Boston Scott's going undrafted. 
13th round is a great place to take this guy. If you want the discount version that's already shown he can be productive in the office, offense, though, you might instead choose Boston Scott with your final pick of the draft. Pick your poison here is neither cost, you know, Gainwell's cost is not too high, but I like the idea that one of these guys could be um, not necessarily a standalone play, but like in a full point PPR league in the right matchup. Yeah. You could, you could potentially start one of these guys. I mean, if, if, if you're going up against a team that's like, that's invested heavily in, uh, in like the linebacker position or, or they're, you want good uh, route running running backs matched up against guys who are, who are linebackers who are, who are just there to stop, stop the running back, so to speak. Um, yeah. So one of these guys could bring you value in, in full point PPR. As far as Fulgham and, and Rager go, I mean, Rager's rookie season was like abysmal. Like however bad you think it was, it was worse than that. It, uh, it was notably a bad season. I'm not terribly optimistic that he's going to be able to turn around. Now, to be fair, he did injure, I think it was his rotator cuff or sprained AC joint early in the season. It was the same thing, I think, that uh, that Anthony Miller had at the beginning of uh, of his rookie season. Um, and he, he played with it. He played with it all year, right, uh, Rager. He, he got injured, like, in training camp with that. Uh, so kudos to him. But I don't know. I don't know if he's going to be able to turn things around, then you got Fulham and you got uh, Greg Ward too. There's a lot, there's a lot of depth here. And I'm uncertain that these guys are going to be able to separate from each other. They kind of all just could operate in the like 40 to 55 target range and not really bring you a whole lot. Washington football team. So this one's interesting. One of the, the frightful things with the Washington football team is that their defense is probably the best in the league. And it's, it's, it's so good that you might be concerned to take some of their passing game components because like for your fantasy team, so quarterback receiver, that kind of thing, because the defense might kind of control the clock for them and uh, not like allow them to get into shootouts. But when we, when we parse through the strength of schedule aspect via sharpfootballstats.com, which I really can't recommend highly enough, it is a free tool again. Efficiency of opposing passing games, 11th hardest. So it's right on that, you know, top 10 borderline. It's not, it's not like the Eagles with being the, the, the easiest, but 11th hardest, that's nothing to shake a stick at. Efficiency of opposing pass defenses, ninth softest. Efficiency of opposing run games, 16th softest. Uh, efficiency of opposing run defenses, 10th softest. So what we're looking at here from a passing perspective is they're going to have passing offenses they're facing that are able to put points on the board. These are good, good passing offenses. That's going to push game script in Washington's or well, in our, in our favor, not in Washington, Washington might struggle uh, to, to win games. But as far as uh, fantasy points goes, we like that when our quarterbacks and our passing games have to play other good passing games, right? That's an integral part of, of parsing through uh, fantasy football matchups. So they they're, they're facing good passing offenses. They're facing bad pass defenses. That's very good for us. That's really good for the Washington football team. Uh, uh, passing prospects and then kind of a similar thing with the the, the opposing opponents run game there it's just kind of a wash it's whatever but 10 softest run defense slate we will take that like that's that's good that's something that these guys can, t- can uh can take advantage of so terry mclaurin um the dude's a beast he's he's perhaps a, a slightly undersized for what we would think of like a julio jones you know kind of x receiver but this dude is is a, a freak athlete and he's he hits the necessary weight thresholds and everything i, I think he's at like six foot one and, you know, over 205, maybe 210 or something like that. Like he, he's, he's built to last. Um, his yards per route runs last couple of years have been totally respectable for, for a young receiver, 2.05 uh, in his, in his rookie year, that was 13th in the NFL last year. He dropped a little bit, but he saw like a 40, uh, uh, up, uh, 41 more targets in his sophomore season than in his rookie campaign. It was 93 to 134. So you're going to see a little bit, a little bit of a dip in, in, in efficiency uh, in yards per route run. His yards per route run last year went down to 1.87, which is 25th. Um, rookie season finished as wide receiver 27, half point PPR. Last season, sophomore season, uh, finished wide receiver 21. I think that he's in for a career year this year. He was playing with the combination of Case Keenum, Dwayne Haskins, and Alex Smith in the last two seasons. They've got Ryan Fitzpatrick, who, who, last season, Ryan Fitzpatrick, he was having like the best season of his career. 
his completion percentage above expectation. So uh, very smart computers look at film. This is not, keep in mind here, it's an analytical thing. It's, it's a statistic, but what you're seeing is with a computer, we're measuring like distance between receiver and defender and judging the, 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 how difficult that throw was. We're also factoring in things like where is the pass rusher in relation to, uh, to Ryan Fitzpatrick and how often do people complete these passes? That's what completion percentage over above expectation is, or if for next gen stats, yeah, above expectation, typically it's over expectation, but he had the seventh best rating last year at 3.5%. Miami only benched him because they wanted Tua to get in there. It was his time. Fitz, I know it's, it might be the last season of his career, but it seems as though we actually turn a corner. And I know we've said that, uh, you know, from time to time, but I think that we're going to get the best version of Ryan Fitzpatrick. And that's awesome, right? McLaurin playing with that terrible group of quarterbacks, like Alex Smith, I'm sure he, if I went and looked up his average intended air yards, it's, it's well towards the bottom of the league. He's now going to play a 17 game season with what I like to refer to as a human jugs machine in Ryan Fitzpatrick, not out of the range of possibilities that McLaurin goes over 150 targets, especially 17 games. I mean, the guy could get up to like 170. I really like Terry McLaurin this year. He is 3.08 wide receiver, 11 ADP, uh, 308 is fantastic. Wide receiver 11 is, is a little expensive. I do like the, the Dallas guys ahead of him just on a, a consistency basis because of Dak Prescott. Like, I really like Ryan Fitzpatrick, and I think he could do it, but I know Dak Prescott can do it, so I feel a little bit better. So I've got Terry McLaurin as the, the wide receiver 15, but if you are in the mid to late area of the third round, go ahead and draft McLaurin if you want. I think if you're volume drafting, mix it up. Take take McLaurin as like the 10th receiver from time to time. Take him as the 18th if he's there. Uh, but Terry McLaurin, very high on this guy le- th- this year. At worst, I think you're getting a, a high and wide receiver too, and there's a very good chance that you're getting yourself um, a guy who's going to hit like top five to eight numbers on a, you know, every other week kind of basis. Um, as far as the other pass catching components go, um, Curtis Samuel is a fantastic player football player and I think that that he's going to be a great guy to have as a flex option and I think he's going to work wonders for Ryan Fitzpatrick right he's a terrific route runner he's very quick he likes to go downfield that that works within the Ryan Fitzpatrick framework so I would be happy to take either of those guys at ADP don't forget that they also drafted Diami Brown who is a a uh, he's going to be a downfield receiver he's going to he's just going to be like a burner and they also drafted Antonio Gandy Golden, who, if memory serves, is a a, a, a high quality athlete. Um, we like these like freaky guys that can just kind of make freak plays. That because Brian Fitzpatrick, when you got him back there, he's he's not going to be afraid. Now it might be an interception, but he's not going to be afraid to throw it to him. And we love that. So I, I like all of these guys as as late round dart throws. Um, I think that uh, so I don't have the data here in front of me, but I'll I'll try to get to this in a speedy manner. Yeah. Ryan Fitzpatrick currently going as the, tw- the QB 20 in, in the end of the 13th round. Yeah. Smash that draft button at that point is like your QB three or QB four and, and just stack a couple of these pass catchers. Um, Logan Thomas finishes like the tight end six in half point PPR scoring last year. And I think it was the tight end three in full point PPR scoring. Uh, he just got a mega deal. I think it was like 27 million over three years. Maybe it was four years, but this dude just got paid. They liked what they saw at a tight end Logan Thomas this year. I think he is a, a totally fine guy to take at ADP. Uh, good for you, man. You made the position switch. That's awesome. Um, in terms of the backfield. So last year, we all thought that Antonio Gibson, who's six foot uh, over 220 pounds, sometimes listed like up to 230, 6'2", uh, 228. He's a former wide receiver. He's a wide receiver in college. He was very good. He made the transition to play running back, and we all went woohoo towards the the end of draft season. You know, people were starting to get really on board with him as being the bell cow, and we liked him. Excuse me. We really liked him because one of what his theoretical upside would be. The downside is that he wasn't – he didn't go through the natural selection process that a lot of running backs go through in terms of the ones that actually end up making it to the NFL. Football is a brutal sport and, and playing running back is really, really hard from an injury perspective. 
guys that have been playing running back through high school, through a couple years in college, and then go into the pros are guys who just genetically were built to take those hits to the side of their knees. Antonio, uh, Antonio Gibson, I'm, I'm, I've got Gandy Gold in my head, but um, Antonio Gibson, I'm sure he played out of the backfield in high school, college, he was a receiver though. And so we didn't quite know if he could take hits from big boys uh, against, you know, in, in the NFL. Well, last year he proved that he, that he could. Um, he, he, from a rushing perspective, he was in the top 20. I think he was the running back 18 when it came to yardage you know uh, running back 20 841 uh no it's getting away from me 795 okay so just just barely under uh, 800 rushing yards played in 10 games or excuse me played in 14 games only started 10 and he totaled 11 touchdowns we love that when it comes to the passing game another reason we liked him is because of ron rivera and scott turner who were the two coaches uh ron rivera then head coach of the carolina panthers and scott turner quarterbacks coach of the Carolina Panthers, two guys who welcomed Christian McCaffrey to Carolina. Now, Clark, if you're listening, I'm not trying to upset you with the, the DC CMC district of Columbia, Christian McCaffrey comparison, but what this dude is, is he's a big bodied dual threat running back. And we all thought that he was going to get this kind of Christian McCaffrey treatment by these two guys who, who worked with Christian McCaffrey for a couple of years before they, uh, you know, left Carolina ended up in Washington, but they played a bunch of games last year with Alex Smith, who had almost had to have his leg amputated uh, a couple of years before. He's had all these muscle grafts. One of his legs is just is surgically smaller and weaker than it should be. They put J.D. McKissick in there for a ton of passing down work. And now the, where the passing down work gets kind of complicated is on the one hand, uh, there's going to be receiving work. And on the other, there's going to be pass blocking work. Well, why did J.D. McKissick get so many snaps? He caught a ton of balls. I think he was the second most targeted running back in the league behind Alvin Kamara. Um, he had games where he caught like 14 and then 15 and then 14 again, or it was targeted that many times. It's just crazy target totals. But what they really liked was the fact that that he was really good at pass blocking. So uh, sorting through Pro Football, Fo- Pro Football Focus's database, a uh, minimum of 65 pass blocking snaps in the running back, uh, in terms of the running back position, JD McKissick's grade of 61.7 was the sixth best in the NFL. Uh, Antonio Gibson, they gave him a few attempts there. He had 20 pass blocking snaps, graded out at 22.9, uh, which was you had to you had to go past the top 50 um, performers of the position. So he's yeah, he was a a second string uh, pass blocker running back it was really really bad which is fair right he's, he's switching positions for the nfl so this season though he he's had a full season now to acclimate and they now no longer have a guy who they have to worry about getting his leg broken if he gets tackled in alex smith they've got a big man back there brian fitzpatrick he's been playing for a long time he's got a slight rushing propensity the dude can take it they're not going to be as worried about pass protection from the running back position as they were last year with alex smith Gibson, though, here's the thing. I've got him as my running back 14. He's going at uh, 2.02, so second pick of the second round, uh, running back 11. You're paying for him at his ceiling there, and I don't have a problem with that in theory, but last year he suffered a turf toe injury. injury. Turf toe, surprisingly, even though it's just a little toe, it's really hard for players to play with because the injury occurs um, on the base of the foot. I think it's at the, the, the toe joint where the toe joint connects with the foot. So, I mean, if you think about like when you're running, like, I mean, or even just stepping, like put, put your foot on the ground and just try to rock up onto your toes. That point takes a ton. It's the big toe too, I believe. It takes like all of your body weight. And so it, even though it's a toe, it's a very difficult entry uh, for, for anyone to play with, but especially a running back who just has to burst through holes constantly. Um, the best case scenario, and again, this is studying, this is from the work specifically. I, I've, I called upon the work of, of Jesse, Dr. Jesse Morse, but this off season, I've been reading more of Dr. Porras. Um, what Dr. Porras has had to say about this is basically, you don't want him to have to have surgery because you got to go in there and you cut stuff and you don't like cutting stuff in that teeny, teeny tiny little area. Um, so he did not have surgery this off season to deal with the turf toe injury. He's still dealing with the injury that he suffered uh, in the 2020, 2021 season. That's not great. What we might end up seeing 
and I'll link to the, the interview that, that Dr. Boras did um, where he talks all about this. But what we might end up seeing is that this is a dude who's, even though he's only in his second year, he doesn't practice on Wednesdays a la many a veteran, right? We just get the DNP and we get to wonder, oh crap, how serious is it? <clears throat> Maybe he's a dude who only practices in a limited fashion during the season, right? Like he only practices, he goes DNP on Wednesday, limited practice participation on Thursday. And then he gets a, uh, a full one in on Friday and hopefully, you know, full on the walkthrough on Saturday. And he might be a guy who, if you draft him, you have to really monitor the practice reports and you are ready at game time to determine if his toe pain is too bad. Now, this is a thing that can be managed, this injury, um, and it can just like hopefully get better over time, but they might just be injecting him with like anti-inflammatory or pain-killing shots. Players play with that kind of treatment with this injury, but we just aren't going to know uh, if that, that program is going to work for them until we're in season. There have been whispers, and I, this is linked to in the NFC East piece with some guys who were talking about uh, DC beat reporters were at um, Washington football team training camp practices, and some are saying that they can see that he looks a little bit uncomfortable. He doesn't quite look the same when he's cutting. It's early in training camp. It's you know it's July 29th. We're going to need to see. Uh, I hope that he gets a decent amount of work if he can handle it early in the preseason so we can get a good feel for what this is like. If his body responds totally fine to weekly treatments of injections, physical therapy, yada, 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 you're getting a steal here. J.D. McKissick will be on the field, but not like he was last season. It is totally, totally reasonable to put within Antonio Gibson's range of outcomes a workload of over 200 touches, or excuse me, 200 carries, probably 220 and maybe even 250. He had 170 last season. This is a guy who should be getting like, he should get like 100 targets, but I think that, Clearing the 300 touch threshold threshold is entirely possible. But if you sign up to draft him at the beginning of the second round, which means he's going to be your running back one, or you go running back, running back if you want to. Uh, but if there's a guy like Steph Diggs there at the end of the first round, you better be taking him. You just need to understand if you draft Gibson that you're going to have to monitor the practice reports. So accept that. And then get excited because this dude is, is studly and he's in a fantastic position. And that'll do it for the NFC East. Thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed the animated discussion. I know that I did. Uh, I will be back, hopefully with my man, Clark Barnes, to talk about the next division, which will be unveiled then. Until then, goodbye, my friends.